Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship here in the Old Kirk. And a warm welcome to those watching online and to those listening to the Dial a Sermon service. A couple of intimations. First, this is your last opportunity if you wish to make a donation towards the work of the Deaf Society and the 24-hour golf marathon. The envelope is in the vestibule. Also, the Guild Committee have a meeting on uh, the 10th of August at 10 a.m. in the church halls. And finally, the Old Kirk made his or sorry, changed history this week. I was doing a little investigation into where the baptismal register that contains Burnsy's entry, um, and I discovered it is held by the National Records Office for Scotland. And when I wrote to them and asked whether we could get this back for the um, christening gown exhibition, um, they sent an, a letter back to me saying, re-reference um, the baptismal register for Alloway Parish Church. So when I responded to them, I put, um, can I point out to you there was no church in Alloway when Burns was alive. There was a derelict one across the road, um, which he wrote a poem about. But um, he was baptised by the minister of the old Kirk of Air, William Dirimple, in the house the day after he was born. And thought that is either going to help us or hinder us to get our uh, record back. I got a nice record back, say, a letter back saying um, they have now changed the notation um, at the National Records for Scotland. <laughs> so, <laughs> but would you believe it? The people who are supposed to be looking after our history don't even know where or who baptised Robert Burns. Oh, what is the world coming to? Anyway, we're going to sit quietly and have our prayers for Ukraine. Thank you. We begin with the hymn, Pray for the World.
Let us pray. Sovereign God, beginning and end of all, ruler over time and space, we acknowledge you as the one and only God. Hear us in your mercy, redeem and restore us. We worship you in your majesty. We praise you for your greatness. We thank you for your guidance. Forgive us for the way we fall into worshipping idols rather than you, putting you second to our other interests and concerns, imagining we know all there is to know of you, tying you down to our own limited understanding. Hear us in your mercy. Redeem and restore us. Forgive us for attempting to direct your will and dictate your actions, preferring our way to yours as though we know better than you. Forgive us for losing sight of your love, refusing your grace, overlooking your blessings, frustrating your purpose. Hear us in your mercy. Redeem and restore us. Forgive us the mistakes we make, the sins we fall into, the hurt we cause through straying from your side. Sovereign God, Teach us more day by day of your greatness, of all that you are and all you have done. And so may we give you the worship and service that is rightly yours. Hear us in your mercy. Redeem and restore us. And hear us now as we say our family prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from the Old Testament from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Reading from Jeremiah chapter 7. Hear the word of God. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. Amen. We sing when we walk with the Lord.
morning. Our second reading comes from the New Testament and is the version of the two builders from Parable Patter, the hoose and the sand. I'll tell you a tale about Jimmy McPhail, who decided to build his own hoose. Nay wimpy for him, too expensive for Jim, who with money was no fast and loose. For Jim was a fly guy, a right do or die guy, a typical Glaswegian scruff, who scorned all tradition like planning permission and other such trivial stuff. He maintained regulations like laying foundations were strictly for punters and mugs. He just needed cover for his wife and mother with somewhere outside for the dugs. And he wanted it quick, so he decided to stick to a site just as flat as can be. So he plunked for the beach, which was in easy reach, or the shops and the pubs and the sea. And the plan was to nick the occasional brick and some stains fray an all disused quarry. And he got for his mates a few things in some crates that had fell off the back of a lorry. <laughs> then he went to the, the queue down the road at the brew with a great wad of cash in his hand. And before very long, there was quite a wee gang busy labouring down on the sand. He had one or two bods, humping second-hand hods, and a guy with some wood and a saw. But neither of this crew had the least scooby-doo about just how to pit up a wall. So nobody thought to suggest that they ought to perhaps think of sinking some piles. They just laid all the bricks, took their shovels and picks, then stood back with big glaikit smiles. Still, the work was complete, and the house looked a treat on the day that the family moved in. But the very first night, they awoke with a fright when they heard this colossal great din. For a fierce howling gale, thunder and lightning and hail was pounding the walls of the house, which of course couldn't stand on just nothing but sawn, so it gradually shook itself loose. Then it fell to the ground with a terrible sound, and his wife and his mother got soaked. But that's no half as bad as they did to the lad, for the wee fairly nearly got choked. So the message to take for wee Jimmy's mistake is that when you go building a house, if you want it to last, get foundations rock fast, for without them the rest is no use. And as Jesus made clear, or the people who hear what he teaches but choose to ignore, and instead take a stand on the world's shifting sand, will find out that there's trouble in store. For they'll all discover that life's cosy cover will one day be washed clean away. They'll be left on the beach, with all hope out of reach, when it comes to that last judgment day. But the ones who decide to no drift with the tide, but instead put their trust in the Lord, Though they might still get wet, they'll eventually get a heavenly hame for reward. So you see that your faith and your hoosh they should bathe be established upon a sound base. Then whatever befalls, you'll have gits that they was to keep some of the rain off your face. <laughs> it's one of the good ones. We're going to sing again. O sacred head, sore wounded. Thank you. 
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Father, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 7 contains one of the most stark warnings against taking God for granted. In it, Jeremiah reminds the people of what had happened to their beloved temple at Shiloh because of the apathy and entitlement of the people. God let it be destroyed. For decades they had shouted loudly and proudly, this is the temple of the Lord. And then gone out and oppressed the alien, the widow and the fatherless. God could not and would not stand by any longer. And so he let the enemies of Israel tear down the sanctuary. Decades later, the actions of the people were forcing God into acting again. Only this time, it would be the very land that they stood on that would be taken from them. Fortunately, the people responded and the land was saved. But only because God only because the people returned to the path prepared for them by God. In the coming weeks, the future of the Old Kirk and many other churches in the presbytery is going to be decided. The options for us include either one or even two of the three buildings being closed, or all three being kept open for a limited period until the ministers move on. I don't know which way the presbytery will jump. And even if they agree to keep the three buildings open, the next hurdle would be to convince Edinburgh to agree as well. What I do know is this. If we simply reply, rely on repeating the phrase, you can't close the old kirk, just as the people of Israel shouted, the temple of the Lord, then our cause will be lost. God does not want empty words from us. He wants action. And that is what the session have been trying to do ever since the COVID restrictions were removed. And things are looking up. We now have the sea cadets using the halls. And the provost has written a letter to the presbytery arguing for the retention of the old kirk. Because they see it as part of their plans for the town centre regeneration. But we need to do more. We need to get the lunches up and running again. But that will require new helpers and volunteers whether that's to make the soup, spread the rolls, or serve the tea and coffee. The old squad, and I emphasize the word old, needs new blood. And I'll pay for that later. <laughs> but there are also many other tasks that willing hands are required for. This is not the time to sit back wringing our hands and gnashing our gums. If we are to secure our future, then we need to make sure that we are traveling the path that God wants us to travel. And we must not let anyone, presbytery included, deflect us from remaining faithful to God. While I was thinking about the future and what is to come, I was reminded of a TV program that I almost made an appearance on, and it wasn't Crime Watch. <laughs> it was, who do you think you are? The idea was to take a celebrity of a well-known figure and trace their family tree. The celebrity in question was not me, it was Ian Hislop, the editor of Private Eye, and team captain on Have I Got News For You. His father came from Ayr, and was a teacher, and Ian was educated at Ayr Academy. And the plan was to film him back at the school during an assembly, and that's where I came in. I had to lead the assembly. The event started with the head teacher, David Matheson, and myself meeting Ian Hislop, who's smaller than he looks on TV and has a handshake like a wet lettuce. We had to record the assembly twice because they only had one camera. And then David Matheson and I had to sign a contract, basically giving away any rights to repeat fees if the show was shown multiple times. The big night arrived and we discovered that the whole section about Air Academy had been cut and something about a relative being buried in the French war graves inserted in its place. My 15 seconds of fame had gone and so had any fees for the performance. <laughs> but back to the presbytery plan. One of the jobs of a minister is to keep the congregation looking forwards, following in the footsteps of Jesus, but just occasionally. It is also good and right 
to look back and to see where we have come from. Because it's as we look back, we see God at work in the lives of the people who have gone before us. So this morning I want to pose the question, where have we come from? I recently discovered a booklet about the history of the Old Kirk. And I would recommend that if you haven't already read it, that you do so. And if you have, that you read it again. And it's here. Just imagine it in my right hand. I forgot it. <laughs> it's full of wonderfully inspiring and encouraging stories about this kirk. And about the people who have worshipped here for so many years. And the first account I want to mention happened in 1652. When a certain Oliver Cromwell's troops invaded the town and built a fort to protect the harbour and the coastline. Unfortunately, the walls of the fort enclosed the then parish church of St. John, and the building was used as a stable. Tragedy. The building that had served the town since the 12th century was taken from the people. The building that had housed the Parliament of Scotland under Robert Bruce was gone. But was it the crisis that we might think it was? For decades, there had been mutterings that the original Catholic Church was unsuited for Reformed Presbyterian worship. And discussions had taken place on how to rectify the situation. So what on the face of it seemed to be a disaster for the town actually led to the people getting a brand new church, fit for purpose, and partially paid for by the government. Isn't God wonderful? We might be facing an uncertain future. But as long as we remain faithful, then God will make sure that any dark cloud hanging over us will have a silver lining. He did it before. So why won't he do it again? The second event I want to mention isn't really an event. Rather, it's a continuing theme throughout the 350 plus years of this present building's existence. Since the doors opened in 1654, this church has always had a good working relationship with the town and the merchants and the trades. In more than name, the kirk session and the magistrates were one and the same. They simply wore different hats when they sat around the table in the merchant's loft in front of me, discussing on the one hand church business as the kirk session, or town business as the magistrates. Together, they helped the poor of the town with clothes and shoes and even coffins. The mortification board under the sailor's loft is just one example of their working together. The importance and strength of the relationship between the church and the trades can be seen on the window above the trades loft, gifted by the trades of the town as a token of their appreciation for the church's support. That sense of togetherness between the church and the council is still strong today. So much as so that, unsolicited by me, the provost wrote a letter to the presbytery, expressing their concerns about the future of the church and supporting its retention. The support that Kate has received regarding the christening gown exhibition shows that the people of the town still hold the old kirk in high esteem. So we should take courage from the fact that in the past we had many supporters in the town. And that they remain loyal even to this day. Mind you, it would be nice if a few more of them turned up on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Another trait that can be traced down through the years is the length of tenure of many of its ministers. The Reverend John Hunter stayed for 60 years. The Reverend Eccles spent 40 years at the Old Cup, having been restored to the pulpit in 1689 after the Episcopal priests were run out of town when the killing times and the covenanters came to an end. The church also had some highly learned and respected ministers. William de Rimpel, who was Doctor of Divinity and moderator of the General Assembly. Now, while the present incumbent may not share many of the traits of his predecessors, there is one that he shares several traits with, and that is the Reverend Dr. McGill, 1761 to 1807. On several occasions, the Reverend McGill found himself in trouble with the Presbytery and the General Assembly because of his views. 
He was also said to have played golf every day of the week except Sundays and feast days. <laughs> but what long ministries do suggest is a sense of peace and harmony between congregation and minister. And that is always the best way to get things done. And I'd like to think that that peace and harmony still exists today. The final comment I want to make is that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Over a hundred years ago, the following was recorded in the session minutes. Undesirables have been found in the churchyard and steps had to be taken to stop the stained glass windows from being damaged by rocks. You're not the first beetle to complain. <laughs> and of course, session field. It was an ever-present sore for the elders. In 1841, it was recorded that the rent was £171 in arrears, a considerable amount of money in those days, and that the maintenance of the buildings, boundary, fences, etc., had been postponed until their condition was virtually ruinous. Some problems will always be with us, but as long as we are still here to deal with them, then that is all that matters. At this point in time, we may not easily look into the future and see where our direction of travel will take us. But we can look to our past. And we can see how God has guided our forefathers. And from that, we can set a course to the future with the confidence and the assurance that since God was faithful to his people in the past, why should we doubt him as his people in the present? The old kirk has seen it all before, and it has always come through in some shape or form, and I believe that it will do so again in the coming weeks and months. I end with these words from St. Paul. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let's go forward together, trusting God and learning from our past. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these thoughts and to his name be the praise and the glory. Let's worship God with our offering. God, day by day you bless us. Day by day you supply more than our needs, often more than we could ever want. And sometimes we take you for granted. But today we thank you for your generosity and we bring our offering to you, asking that you would accept and bless and use it, that your kingdom might grow. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayers for other people. Let us pray. Loving God, so often we fail to thank you for all we have received. We are quick to ask for more, but slow to appreciate what we already receive. We are quick to bring our requests, but slow to show gratitude when they are granted. We are quick to complain when life is hard, but slow to rejoice when it is good. Loving God, forgive us. Living God, we pray for those people who have lost hope in their dreams, their circumstances, or in life itself. We pray for those who have lost the hope of finding a partner or of raising a family, the hope of going to college, university, or further studies, the hope of finding a home, or any permanent roof over their heads, the hope of securing employment or a use for their skills. We pray for those who despair of seeing freedom, justice, peace or reconciliation. Those who despair of finding adequate food and clothing. Those who despair of receiving help and healing. We pray for those who have given up on life. 
those with terminal illness, those who have lost, lost the will to keep on fighting, those whose spirits have been crushed so that they can no longer bounce back, those who want to take their own lives because they have lost all hope, those so afflicted by starvation and disease that they cannot carry on. Living God, there is so much despair in our world and for many there seems little reason to hope. Reach out, we pray, to all whose belief in the future has been destroyed and grant new dreams where the old have died, rekindled purpose where confidence has been undermined, support where there seems to be nothing to le left to hold on to, and hope that one day your kingdom will come and your will be done. Lord of all hopefulness, hear our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. We close by singing the hymn, In Christ Alone. grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love, now and evermore. and keep safe.